Good morning. morning. Welcome to Beulah Baptist Church. If you're out there on the web, we're coming to you live from downtown Lyles, Virginia, here at Beulah's headquarters. So glad you're out there with us. So glad each and every one of you are here with us this morning. Uh, Have you seen any of the big mega churches, like in, in, you know, in some of the bigger cities? They they had the big flashing lights and... uh, you know, little country churches years ago, they tried to attract attention by putting up a tall steeple. And most of them had a bell in it. Well, there was one little small town, small church, had a great big steeple. And they had a bell in it, but they, they couldn't get the bell to ring. It just wouldn't, they'd pull the rope, but it wouldn't ring. So the preacher was inquiring around, and one little fellow said, well, I can make it ring. The preacher said, well, give it a try. So he goes up through the trap door, climbs up in the steeple, and he gets way back against the wall, and he runs and rams his head into the bell. The bell rings. The preacher said, wait. Hey, when he come down, the preacher said, hey, you got it to ring. He said, I'll tell you what, we'll give you $2 every week if you'll go ring the bell. Well, the next week, Little guy, he goes up to the trap door, climbs the ladder, gets up there, and he runs back and rams his head into that bell, knocks him out, and he falls all the way to the porch. The preacher's standing there, and a a lady come up. The preacher said, I don't even know his name. The lady looked at him. She said, well, I don't know his name either, but his face rings a bell. (laughs) That that was a Tim Dixon type joke. Uh, so glad each and every one of you here this morning. Kevin, you can laugh too. You know it's. Uh, uh, glad you're here this morning. I was glad when they said, uh, "Let us go into the house of the Lord." And I'm glad each and every one of you are here this morning. We well, love you, and God loves you. And please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. And Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, we asked you this morning to just settle here over this church, so over these few people that are here this morning, Lord, and just, uh, just settle on our hearts and our minds. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, forgive us of those sins that we committed, and forgive us of those sins of omission, Lord, for those times when we should have said something and didn't. And Lord, this morning we just ask that you be with us, that everyone let all those problems of the week go and, uh, and just concentrate on you. Thank you, Lord. We love you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing? Joy to the world. Joy to the world. Please stand.
Well, that and Dave Vogel's Hawaiian Christmas shirt is our Christmas in July celebration, apparently. Right? Amen. Well, Merry Christmas in July. Can't make this stuff up, Dave. Right, so we are at our prayer time, and I would like you to turn to the back of your bulletin, um, and I'd just like you to glance over that list. Some of those names we call on a fairly regular basis. Some of those we don't say very often. Um, Mary and Gary Palsgrove is on the list. Joan Dawson. Tammy, is it Coriel? All right. Linda Fallon, Beth Smith, Eddie and Charlotte C., Lisa Penix, Christians all over the world, the Grigsby family, Yvonne Minor, the Morgan family, Patsy Batten, Mary Carter, Elizabeth Ann Davis, our shut-ins, uh, Cullen Oliver, Michael Headley, um, uh, Morgan, is Morgan, Morgan's not watching this morning, or at least she wasn't just a moment ago. She's at work. She's at work this morning. All right. Um, just want you all to see all of those names. Um, and if you want us to, if you want to call one of those names again, that's just fine. Um, I hope that you'll send Morgan a card or a letter sometime in the next week or so, just to let her know we're thinking about her. Um, what other prayer concerns are on your heart this day? They're all in the bulletin. They're all in the bulletin, and I just read through them all. Yes, the widow of Bristow Balderson right. in Newland has passed away. We don't know her name, but we want to pray for the Balderson family, by all means. Ken. Doris King. Let's pray for Doris King. I want to tell you just a little bit about, uh, not very much, but a little bit about Doris. I tried to go see her. Um, and uh, a couple of you were correct. She's not living over here with her sister. Uh, I, I went to the house, I knocked on the door, and I couldn't get anybody to respond. But, but we hear through the grapevine, she's probably in Tappahannock with her son. Re she is? You talked to Doris the other day? Um, that's the latest I've heard. Can you tell us anything about your conversation, Beth? Okay, did y'all hear that? She said that, uh, all right, um, that uh, Beth has talked to Doris, and Doris said she's got some signs of dementia, and they're waiting to hear, she's waiting to hear whether she's going to stay with her son or if she's going to need to move to a facility where she can be better cared for. Um, I'd like to get with you or after church so that I know how you got a hold of her because I've, I've tried. You saw Doris in the parking lot. Okay. Well, that, exactly. Um, and so, um, does anybody have her son's number? No. All right. All right. Well, if anybody comes up with a way to contact Doris, you let me know. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sometimes delirium, med medicine-induced delirium, can look like Alzheimer's. The difference is if you stop taking the medicine, the delirium can go away. Alzheimer's doesn't really go away. So that's probably the first thing they need to sort out is, is this medication-induced delirium or is this a permanent uh, progressive situation? So pray for, pray for Doris. Pray for her family. We've got a sister. We've got a son. Um, and that... Maybe we'll figure out how to get a hold of her. Okay, it's it. Okay, thank you. Mary Ann. Okay. See, that's why I come to church. Get all this information. It's really helpful. Thank you, May. Other other needs you want us to pray for.
Sure. So uh, Rebecca has been here and visited for a day or two or a few days, and she's going to be traveling back to Savannah um, with, Ellie. with Ellie. What happened to Jack? Very well. Well, that's, you know, divide and conquer. That makes sense, too. So, so Rebecca and Ellen will be uh, traveling back to Savannah. So let's pray for them as they go on Tuesday. So if you were so inclined, I'll, I'll um, invite your prayers and get, get, make an announcement that you may or may not have heard. Maybe one or two of you have heard this from me. But Terry and I are putting our Fredericksburg house on the market on the 1st of August to move to the Northern Neck. And we're excited about that. Um, we're both pretty worn out. Um, and um, we're trying to downsize um, from the house in Fredericksburg. And um, anyway, there's, it's a process, as you well know, those of you who've done that in the, it recently. And um, we're excited about it. But there's a lot going on um, at our house to get the house listed, to all the things around the house, the little touch-up things that one has to do. So we're doing that, and uh, we're excited to be a little bit closer, more, a little bit more permanently in the near future. And I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, we're excited about it. Thank you. Yep. Um, praises? Yeah, Hilda. That's awesome. Indeed. Um, let me, uh, I just realized I'm not saying that, I'm not repeating it for the folks online. So then I'll do that and then Kelly, I'll come back to you. So Hilda mentioned that one of her friends um, who we've prayed for before uh, has had cancer and she's just received a report that she's cancer free. And so Hilda's praising God for that, her friend having been. Uh, been healed or at least treated well and uh, being cancer free. So now, thank you, Kelly. Praise the Lord and got moved in. Cats did great. She likes work and we just have more than one fight a day. <laughs> so so Kelly is praising God that that Morgan has gotten moved in, that the cats did okay with the trip that you had no more than one fight a day for three weeks. That's 21 fights. That seems like a lot to me, but, but, but okay. No more than. Okay, so maybe not tw 21 or less. Um, dis discussments, disagreements. So great. We're, I'm thrilled you're back, and uh, I'm glad that uh, Morgan is enjoying her new job. Absolutely. Other praises? Let's pray together. Here we are, Lord. Glad to be in your house. Glad to be gathered together as your children. As, as this little installment of the kingdom of God right here. God, we pray this day for the Balderson family as they grieve the passing of Mrs. Balderson. Bless all of those who loved her and cared for her, friends and family. Be with them in their grief. Hear their prayers. Sustain them, we pray. God, you know that many of us have been missing Doris King, and we are glad to have a bit of a report on her, but we know that she needs you now more than ever as she's exhibiting some signs that might be dementia She's moved out of her home. She's moved in with her son. And they're assessing how best to take care of her and what the best living arrangement might be for her. God, we pray that you would be with Doris and with her son and with all of those who are involved in that decision. Bless them and keep them and give them your wisdom. May they have your strength and encouragement. God, be with Rebecca and Ellen as they return to Savannah as they rejoin their family there. Bless them and keep them. May they have your traveling mercies. 
God, as we have have read our our bulletin and named many so many names whose names are here, I'll I'll lift up Elizabeth Ann Davis and ask that you be with her. She has not been here in a very long time because of her health condition. We pray that you would be with her and sustain her. God, I pray that you are with Eddie and Charlotte C. They are not able to be here, but they are your children and deserving of our love and respect and our prayers. God, we pray for Yvonne, for the Morgan family as they grieve. God, hear all of these prayers. God, we praise you for old friends who are healed of cancer. We praise you for uh, an adult child who has moved a very long way from us, but who still resides in your heart. God, we have much to be thankful for, mostly for your love, for the sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. God, be with us this day. May we hear you in everything that we do, in everything that we say. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our offertory hymn is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Won't you stand with me and let's sing together.
while you remain standing, we'll read our text for the day. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. Hear these words. Jesus put before them another parable. He said, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then if you'll skip down to verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Jesus answered them, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then... The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone who has ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, have you ever bought bad seed? Robert's nodding he has. Well, once upon a time, I I, may know I am no farmer. She sometimes likes to point that out to me. But once upon a time, I was trying to improve the grass in my lawn. I thought I could save just a little bit of money by purchasing uh, an off-brand of less expensive grass seed. I waited for the right time of year. I prepared the soil. I planted the seed. I watered it regularly, and I waited. I was so excited to see the green sprouts when they came up. I'm sure you know where this is going, though. Yes, the seeds germinated. My grass, what there was of it, well, it grew. But most of what grew was not the grass that I thought I was uh, buying, for which I was buying seed. Most of what grew uh, were the weeds. Um, The grass withered and died, but the weeds... No, no, they, they, they proliferated, they, were, they just grew marvelously. And I learned a lesson. Since that day, I have been careful about purchasing seed. Um, I'm not inclined to look for a budget bar- price or a bargain price on seed. If I'm going to plant something, I, you know, um, I would have thought that the evil one would have not worked for the seed manufacturer. But I was mistaken. Today we have another of Jesus' agriculturally based parables. If you recall last week, we looked at Jesus' parable about the soils. This week we're looking at the parable about the weeds among the wheat. Like many of the parables in Matthew's gospel, in this parable, Jesus is teaching his audience about the kingdom of heaven. He said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. Unlike my story where the good seed was contaminated with the bad seed from the moment of purchase or even before, Jesus says that while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat 
and then went away. When the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And let me just push pause right there and take a brief unaside and say, I want to make sure that you know just a little bit of Baptist history uh, as I take this detour. Did you know that some of the very first Baptists who called themselves Southern Baptists did so because they found biblical evidence to support the practice of enslaving persons of color? Did you know that? They used verses like this one, the one I just read, and many others where slavery is referenced but notably not condemned by Jesus or Paul or any of the other gospel writers. And they used those references to support the notion that enslaving persons was an acceptable moral practice. Meanwhile, other Baptists who refused to believe that the institution of slavery could not possibly uh, be moral, they separated from those Baptists um, who became Southern Baptists. While we're reading a text that speaks of slaves and master, those words are, are even hard to read and hear and say, but it's important to me that, that we think about how some of our predecessors as Southern Baptists have misused and misinterpreted scripture to support holy immoral positions. So let me continue with verse 28, back in our text. Jesus continues his parable. The householder answers, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, well, then do you want us to go gather the gather the, the harvest, or gather the weeds, rather. And he said, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. And, of course, you know the story. The, the landowner said, let them both grow. Let the weeds grow with the wheat until the time of the harvest. And we'll collect them then, and they will be burned. Uh, the weeds will be burned, and then we will gather the wheat. In verses 31 and 32, Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed. In verse 33, he tells the parable of the yeast. In verse 34, Matthew tells us that Jesus used parables regularly to teach the crowds. In fact, Matthew even goes further and says that apart from parables, Jesus taught them nothing, which is a remarkable statement. In verse 35, Matthew quotes a couple of psalms like Matthew liked to do, saying that Jesus' use of parables fulfilled what had been said by the prophet, I will open my mouth and speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. And then in verse 36, Matthew comes back to this story to uh, recollect Jesus leaving the crowd behind and, re and retreating into a house where his disciples begged him Master, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And beginning with verse 37, he outlines the meaning of each symbol in the parable. He says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The son of man, as you well know, is one of the many ways Jesus speaks of himself in Scripture without saying me. Jesus says, the field, well, that's the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. How does it feel to be seed, the good seed, children of the kingdom? The weeds, Jesus says, are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed the bad seed, Jesus makes completely um, unmistakable and says, well, the enemy is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. So after identifying each and every one of the players in this parable in, G, uh, in verse 40, Jesus begins to explain the meaning. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone who has ears listen. In this parable, Jesus seems to be saying that the sower, he, has sown good seed, God's children, throughout the world. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus has broadcast the seed throughout the world, that God's children are, are all throughout the world. Meanwhile, the enemy, the devil, has similarly sown bad seed, who Jesus calls the children of the evil one throughout the world. Now, for whatever reason, Neither Jesus nor Matthew explain why. 
Why did God allow the children of the evil one to proliferate? We likely have many questions at this point. Why did God allow the children of the evil one to proliferate? Like, like the teacher in Ecclesiastes, we might ask, well, why do the evil prosper? Why do the good die young? I've heard people in this congregation ask that kind of a question. Why do the good die young? Again, these why questions are not Jesus' point. They're not Matthew's point. We don't know why God allows evil persons to linger quite so long. What we do know about Jesus' parable is this. The weeds will not be burned until the end of the age. The children of the evil one will not be addressed, will not be judged until the end of the age. Now you might want to ask, well, why doesn't God just get it over with? Why doesn't God just judge the evildoers now? We want a quick justice. We want quick execution of punishments. But that is not what Jesus said is going to happen. Jesus says that at the end of the age, he will send his angels to collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. The angels will throw them into the furnace of fire. While we are trying to discern the meaning of the parable for us, let me read to you what one commentator has said. He wrote, It is possible that this parable served to caution the church, the very earliest church, against rashly expelling questionable members from fellowship. He said, Jesus did not expel Judas from the twelve, although he knew Judas' treachery before he acted to betray him. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus knew well before Judas' betrayal that it was he who would betray him. And yet Jesus didn't expel Judas. I'm thinking, if I knew who was going to betray me, I think I would have removed the threat. I would have wanted to get rid of Judas, but that's me. I'm human, and I wasn't, I wasn't sent by God as God's son. I, I would have wanted to get rid of the threat. The commentator is inferring from the parable something similar to that. He's saying that the the parable may have served as a caution to the early church about expelling questionable members from fellowship. My own personal opinion is this. I would prefer that churches never expel anyone. This verse helps me here. God, and according to this text, Jesus' angels are going to sort it all out in the end. Therefore, I don't believe we need to concern ourselves with trying to decide who should be expelled from membership. The commentator then continues, more likely, however, the parable's concern is with the impatience of those who wanted God to act immediately in outward and final judgment of the wicked and reward the righteous. Did you catch that? The commentator is suggesting that Jesus' audience might simply want God to act quickly, judging the wicked and the righteous now. Here's the thing. Who are the wicked? We think we know. But are we sure? Who are the righteous? We want God to reward us because we're righteous. But do we really deserve it? Um, who's righteous here? Anybody want to put their hand up? Who's righteous? Right. Right. We don't really deserve God's grace apart from God's grace. Amen. So Jesus is telling a parable about not only God's judgment, but about God's timing and ultimately about God's grace. Then the commentator goes on and gets really helpful when he says, Matthew gives us two reasons for delaying the weeding of, until the harvest. One, he says, unless the good be approved, with the bad, and two, because God has appointed an end time for the separation. You don't want to separate. We, we, if, if we make those judgments now, we're going to make mistakes. God said, Jesus said, that's not the job of the, of the children of righteousness. And finally, God has already set a t appointed in a time, and that, that time for separation is in the end. 
And the commentator adds, when we try to assume, when we try to assume God's function as judge, we both disobey God and we risk confusing the good with the bad. Let me see if I can illustrate how we might confuse the good with the bad. Do you recall that I've mentioned that there have been many sexual abuse scandals um, that have come to light in our churches? If you don't remember me saying that, that's okay. I've not made a big point of it. I have mentioned it a little bit from time to time. I'll simply say that these have not always been managed very well, these scandals in the church. Often with victims being accused, uh, with victims of abuse being blamed for their abuse, with no clear means of tracking predatory pastors from churches, with minimal assistance from the denomination to make sure that perpetrators are held accountable. In fact, the foot dragging by our own executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention has been well documented. And remember, I'm, I'm simply trying to illustrate how we might confuse the good with the bad, confuse the wheat with the weeds. This past week, Baptist News Global ran an opinion piece by Susan Shaw where she details an Alabama megachurch has spent four and a half million dollars to create a center for pastoral restoration. I'm thinking we could do a lot with four and a half million dollars for ministry in this community. Um, the center that they have established provides counseling and support for pastors working through issues that cost them their jobs, issues like marital infidelity, sexual abuse. In her piece, Ms. Shaw pointed out that in opening such a center, the church seems to have prioritized the well-being and restoration of the men, some of whom perpetrated crimes, prioritizing their return to ministry over the well-being and healing of their victims. She asserted that evangelicals seem to show a lot of compassion for pastors who commit sexual abuse, but they don't show the same concern for victims of clergy sexual abuse. She pulls no punches, taking churches to task, referring to such actions as when churches refer to these actions as indiscretions or inappropriate relationships, when it would be more accurate, she says, to call these men committed sexual predatory and abusive acts using power of the pastoral position to subject people, especially women and children, to illegal abuse. She goes on, but my reference to the article is simply to illustrate how from time to time, in our rush to judgment, we can confuse the weeds and the wheat. What does this mean for us? Here are just a few observations. First, it was really important to Jesus that he teach this lesson about the kingdom of heaven. We are part of the kingdom of heaven right here, right now. We are going to be part of the kingdom of heaven for a really long time and Jesus wanted to make sure the children of God knew something about the workings of the kingdom of heaven. Second, the fact that Jesus calling himself the son of man is the sower in the story is important. This fact illustrates that Jesus remains active in our world today. Jesus is actively sowing, actively creating, actively sustaining, act actively nurturing the children of God in the world today. I hope that strikes you as important, that Jesus is active in our world. We can grow. We can impact the world around us. We are impacting the world around us in large and small ways. Third, Jesus doesn't really seem to question the existence of evil in the world. He doesn't seem to question, he doesn't question the existence of the devil. Evil is a real and present danger in the world. We cannot avoid getting entangled in some evil in the world. Just like the wheat, when the weeds grow up through the wheat, it entangles the wheat. The weeds have been sown among the wheat. The weeds are going to damage and hinder the growth of some of the wheat. We can anticipate that. We can be watchful. We can do our part to be healthy wheat, healthy children of God. Fourth, when Jesus says that the weeds will be collected and burned at the end of the age, we probably want to pay attention. There's an inevitability to what Jesus is saying. There are parts we might be able to impact, like 
producing more fruit, that each of us makes effort to produce more fruit. But trying to pretend that we can pull up the weeds before the end of the age, trying to pass judgment on the evil we see around us, according to this passage, well, that's premature. And in doing so, we assume more responsibility than is ours to assume. Finally, Jesus ends this parable with what looks like a very stern warning. Let anyone with ears listen. Jesus wants us to hear this message. Jesus wants us to heed this message. Jesus wants us to share his message. We have a role in the kingdom. Jesus wants to assume the position of children of God, bearing fruit according to our ability. As he said elsewhere, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Please pray with me. Touch our hearts this day, O Lord. May we be sensitive to your prodding. May we be mindful of the multitude of ways you may speak to us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'd like you to think about what God might be saying to you. How is God pulling on your heartstrings this day? What does God have to say to you, to this church, to us individually and collectively? Is God calling you here? Is God calling you to rededicate yourself to deepen your own faith? to reach out to your neighbor. While we sing the hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, if you have uh, an inkling that God is speaking to you in a way you want to make public, I hope that you'll either write to us through one of these means or you'll walk down the aisle and you'll visit with me for just a minute here so that you can share that with us and we can share that, that uh, conversation uh, together with you. Won't you stand with me and let's sing together, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Please pray with me. And now as we go from this place, O oh Lord, we pray that you would use us, that you would speak to us, that we would have the ears to hear exactly the message that you have spoken and laid on our hearts. We pray that we would have the courage and the willingness to share that message in the world around us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.